Hi, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and welcome everyone from other time zones. I'm Arthur Demrich, director of the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our May 2021 Innovative Lives program, featuring the athletes and inventors, Sarah Will and Mike Schultz. Um, today, we're meeting on Zoom, and as you can see, the Q&A is your option for asking questions of the panelists. That's if you go to the lower part of your screen. Um, there's also a chat feature if you have any technical problems that you think we can help with. But we primarily encourage you to use the Q&A function. This program is being recorded, but you yourselves are not being recorded since your screens are off, just so you know. This program is really part of the Lemelson Center's core mission to engage, educate, and empower everyone to be inventive, to take a more active and participatory role in technology development, and to work to support equity and access in the innovation and use of new technologies. So as a team, we seek to educate the public about the importance of invention and innovation in several ways. That includes exhibitions, of course, in person and online, our invention education program, which again has a major in-person component during normal times at Spark Labs at the National Museum of American History and in a Spark Lab network sites across the US and soon to be international, but also through online invention activities, which are hosted on the Instructables and Tinkercad platforms, which we encourage you to check out. We also educate the public through programs like this. We want you, our audience, to get a feel for what it means to be an inventor. That includes, of course, structural barriers, but also support systems, the constraints of materials, the constraints of funding, the constraints of how people see you, and the many failures that inventors overcome, but also the joy of seeing your work change the world and the ways in which invention is both a form of enlightenment self-improvement for you, the individual, but also a huge impetus and form of societal improvement. And so we hope a program like this helps empower you, people watching, in how you think about and use technology. So I just mentioned structural barriers and constraints. And as you're gonna hear from our featured guests today, those structural constraints are especially profound for people with physical or cognitive differences from the norms that were established in science and engineering decades ago. We've seen genuine progress in the built environment compared to 50 or 100 years ago. But as you listen to people who use wheelchairs or other mobility technologies, you learn there's still a very long way to go to achieve universal access. Sports is an area, interestingly, where we've seen great progress, and we're gonna learn a lot more about that today. So I'm now pleased to introduce my colleague, Jane Rogers, curator of the sports collection at the National Museum of American History. During her 30 year tenure so far at the museum, Jane has facilitated the growth of the sports collection with an emphasis on Olympic, Paralympic, and extreme and adaptive sports, looking at the changing role of technology in sports and the social and cultural impact of sports on the American narrative. Jane is currently working on an exhibition project on the impact of Title IX on women's sports, and she's also a member of the Lemelson Center's Game Changers exhibition team. She's also working on a book about the Smithsonian skateboarding collections called Smithsonian Skate. Jane, over to you. Thanks, Arthur. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be moderating this discussion on invention and innovation in adaptive sports. And I'm delighted to introduce two incredible adaptive athletes who have made a significant impact on the sports world, as well as in the technological aspect of adaptive sports. First, we have Sarah Will. Sarah has earned 12 gold and one silver medal in four different Alpine ski events at four Paralympic Games, making her one of the most decorated athletes in US ski team history. Sarah was also one of the first adaptive athletes to compete at the Winter X Games, winning a bronze in the Monoskier X Cross. She was inducted into the United States Olympic Hall of Fame in 2009 and is donating objects to the Smithsonian Sports Collection, which I'm super stoked about. Sarah is now a public speaker and an avid advocate for disability rights in her community of Vail, Colorado. Sarah, you wanna introduce yourself to the audience? It's so nice to, to be here with everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, yes, I'm here in Vail, Colorado. We're still currently seeing a little bit of snow. 
and uh, spent 10, 10 to 15 years on the uh, what was then called the US Disabled Ski Team, which is now called the Adaptive Ski Team as terminology changes. And uh, an incredible time racing the world and um, trying different mono skis and trying different types of equipment. I had a, uh, a ski accident when I was 24 years old and um, started mono skiing the next year. And the background that I had as a ski racer very much helped me advance quickly in the sport. And also my, um, my background as a carpenter and uh, somebody who liked to tinker around with wood, um, tools, it, it all led me to, to be a, a better thinker in, in a new sport that I knew very little about. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, and now we have monster Mike Schultz, a Paralympic snowboarder who won a gold and silver medal in snowboarding during his debut at the 2018 Paralympics. Before that though, Mike became the first athlete to win gold at both the X Games in Motocross Adaptive and the Winter X Games in Snowmobile Snowcross Adaptive and has since won 10 gold and one silver medal at the X Games. Mike also created the company Biodapt inventing the Moto Knee and Versa Foot, a prosthetic that uses a patented link system and a shock absorber technology to keep adaptive athletes participating and competing in sports. Mike donated an example of this technology to the museum a few years ago, which has been featured in past exhibitions and will be on display in the Lemelson Center's new ex exhibition, Game Changers, opening in 2023. Mike, you wanna introduce yourself to everybody? Hey, everybody. Well, first off, thanks for the invite uh, to discuss all this fun stuff we're about to. Um, yeah, as you can tell, I'm, I'm kind of a, a guy that enjoys doing a lot of different things. Um, I'm into motorsports, action sports, snowboarding. Um, but the other side, you know, aside from being an athlete and a competitor, um, I absolutely love solving problems in the shop. I, I, uh, I love to challenge myself both mentally and physically. And when my injury happened in 2008, um, you know, I, I just didn't want to give up. So I had to either, uh, you know, give up what I love to do, or I had to problem solve my way back into the activities I loved. And um, I went to work in the shop, designed my own prosthetic legs to get me back into action. And then that evolved into creating my company Biodapt and helping out a whole lot of other amputees around the world, uh, um, get back into action. Some of them, even my direct competitors in snowboarding and motocross. So it's, it's pretty wild. It's been quite an adventure uh, for the last 12 years or so. Um, but yeah, it's fun to share my story with you guys. Great. We are so glad you guys are here today. And we are going to talk about your roles in the adaptive sports arena and um, what part they played in your inventive identity. So thank you both for joining us. And um, let's get down to some questions. Um, so, Sarah, did any of your childhood experiences influence you to become an inventor? And then we'll go to Mike. Absolutely. Um, I, I really credit my parents with sending us outside and letting us fend for ourselves and say, go build something, go play, go do something. And um, usually that involved going to the barn and going into my father's toolbox, which he didn't appreciate all the time, but they encouraged us to go, uh, if your bicycle broke, then figure out how to fix it. If you, if you needed anything, try to fix it yourself before you just put that responsibility onto somebody else. And it made it fun because uh, if that meant operating a hammer, you were going to smash your fingers more than a few times. But that was your battle. Um, and I think that from an early age, we really understood that uh, you try as hard as you can, and then you ask for help. Um, and don't be afraid to fail, because most of the time, it, it wasn't pretty what we, what we came up with invention-wise. But it was fun. We had a really good time. How about you, Mike? Childhood experiences influence you? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds, Sarah, it sounds like we had uh, similar, similar childhoods. I, I, I grew up in the country on a farm 
And uh, so like a lot like Sarah, I, I grew up hanging out in the shop with my dad, trying to fix things, taking apart the lawn mowers, putting them back together. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, he just let me figure things out on my own and, um, you know, kind of stood back and yeah, I, I failed a lot. Um, I made a big mess a lot, but over the course of all that, uh, I learned a lot as well, which, um, you know, it, it, it set me up to understand and process problems in front of me and not relying on everybody else to try and figure them out for me. So extremely valuable um, when your parents kind of just say, figure it out. Yeah. And it seems like that um, attitude has helped you guys in, you know, in later in life doing all this kind of adaptive work. And um, so I think you guys owe your parents a thank you. <laughs> So, um, not always. It made me mad a lot of times when he's like, no, you figured it out on your own. Then he'd walk away. I'm like, I'm serious. Right. <laughs> but it all makes sense now. Right. Exactly. They know what they're talking about. They know what they're talking about. Um, so what skills do you think are particularly important for inventors? Like, do you have any go-to tools that you use? Do you keep notebooks? Do you keep notes on certain things? I don't know who wants to go first. Sarah, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, early on in my uh, adaptive skiing career, it was all nuts and bolts, which was completely different from what I knew as a child of putting on a pair of ski boots and clicking into a pair of skis and you're off. For me in the early days, we had to put a nut and a bolt through a, a bracket and attach that to the, our mono ski, just like a boot and a binding. But that took time. And if there was somebody that was putting that nut bolt in for you that didn't know how, it took more time. So it was important for me to know how much time it took me to either get ready or um, to try to figure out a process um, in, in making small incremental changes. Because you don't get all, you only get in the morning to ski and in the afternoon. So you have to do things quickly and remember what happened in the morning. One little change to what little increments that you made in the afternoon so that you're not doing so many things at once and not knowing what made the difference. Um, so that being said, you have to give yourself for all of those things not to work in your favor. Right. So I always, I was always uh, of the school of thought of taking three steps back, one step forward, um, because I'm very uh, dyslexic and ADD and then my concentration um, often wanders. So I know that I have to start a project and let it and roll away from it, let it go. If I can't figure it out and go back to it, and just, just give myself that time. It, it's not good or bad. It's just part of the process. Right. How about you, Mike? Uh, well, the, my, the best tool in my arsenal is definitely, you know, right here. And mm -hmm. I say that because like a good inventor is able to think complex to, to create a, a simple solution. Like that's the ultimate goal. That's the perfect scenario and thought process. And uh, as far as, you know, um, actual tools, uh, every, well, pretty much all my, my designs start with a pencil and paper and sketch. And then I go to my metal shop from there. I grew up in the metal shop. I've, um, I love cutting and grinding and welding. And uh, I think I can probably cut and grind and weld my way into any, any, uh, any end result, uh, any um, solution. Yeah, I like working with my hands and, and making sparks fly. Um, and then the other thing is like, pay attention to what works and what doesn't uh, and just keep records of it because down the road at some point, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna probably uh, forget it and wanna look back. And so you're not trying to solve the same problem over and over. And that sounds pretty obvious, but uh, when you're working with a lot of different things over time, uh, you tend to forget things and, and you don't wanna waste time by trying to resolve it. So, um, and then using your resources that you have, 
you know, some of it's your personal records, some of it's, well, the internet, I mean, you can, uh, like we were talking last week with Sarah, she's like, yeah, use YouTube, man, you can figure out how to accomplish anything on YouTube, so I, I love that quote, Sarah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great tool. That's awesome, that's awesome. Um, so what about the role of collaboration in your inventive process? I know Sarah talked about having a community to help with that process. How important is that community, Sarah? Uh, that, that community is, is uh, for, for me in the ski industry, uh, I grew up around a, a mountain and a, a maintenance shed and a was, there was a, a vehicle maintenance, there was lift maintenance at, at different ski areas. And my brother worked at, at all of these different departments. So I kind of got to see the internal workings of people who are hardcore mechanics. And then you, uh, you, you form a relationship with the welders. For I, I was in um, downhill mountain bike racing for a long time. And we would always break the swing arm. And I had to know the difference between a TIG and a MIG. And I didn't know what that meant. And, and I'm not a welder, but I had to have access to them and also know how to work with them without wearing out your welcome. <laughs> and also paying them for their time. You can't just expect people to be um, as passionate about your broken material as you are. So um, working with them also uh, in the, the products that you build, say a downhill mountain bike, now you have to also work with the mountain who has already trails that are built for riding bikes. Other trails are built for hiking. So is your invention um, kind to both environments? Does it stay on one environment? For us, we, we tried to stay off the hiking trails, but um, legal, you have other legalities of what is considered accessible on national forest land. What, mm -hmm. can you use a bicycle versus a motorized vehicle? So over time, as things develop, so do rules and regulations. And so you, to remember not to always just stay within the rules and regulations. They're, bent, they're meant to be challenged. They're meant to mm -hmm. be bent a little bit. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't wanna say that I've been known for that, but I've, I've, challenged, I've challenged those rules. Um, and whether that means a piece of your equipment or your starting technique, how you go out of the start, are you gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna work on that each time and see how it changes your, your overall uh, sport. But again, you, when you challenge things, you, you have to remember that you're gonna get a pushback as well. And I remember um, trying to do this in the Paralympics, I was working on a start and I said, well, if I push back a little bit, if there was a little bit of an incline, I could actually get a little bit of roll out of that. And I was working on with that in mind and the, the official who was there the year before told me, I see what you're doing. And if you, you do, do that it. in competition, I will disqualify you. Yeah. And I challenged him. I said, but technically in the rule book, it says, as long as I have these on the ground and I do this and I do that. Uh, and he said, I'm telling you, I will kick you out. So I did challenge it, but I also found the answer before I needed a different way to do it. And I think that happens in all, you know, in all sports, not just adaptive sports, you know, you know, athletes are always pushing that boundary and seeing how far they can go. Um, hey, Mike, when we were talking last week, you mentioned how, um, what it's like to have competition, because, you know, you provide um, prosthetics to your competitors. So what is that like? I mean, you know, that's an interesting little uh, dichotomy you got going there. Yeah, that uh, definitely creates some some challenges uh, over time, but uh, you know the the equipment I build, you know, it got me back into action. Eventually, uh, you know, started the company to help others. So, you know, creating equipment for other athletes helps out in a couple different ways. It it helps 
motivate the, the forward progression of it. When you've got some other elite level athletes pushing things to the limits that like helps us improve the durability and performance. Um, when I've got my, my competitor hat on and, you know, I'm lining up against somebody who just put their moto knee on and, uh, you know, in some cases they end up on the top step of the podium and I don't, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a kind of a bummer on one side, just simply because, you know, they did better than me on a piece of equipment that I built that, you know, probably increased their performance. Otherwise I would have maybe been faster. So it's like, well, I just helped them beat me, but I'm always <laughs> interested in the bigger picture, um, of, of adaptive sports. And, um, you know, I, I see if, if there's three, four, five, six of us competing at a higher level because of the equipment I developed in my shop, there's going to be so many other kids or, or people that are, are watching and they're like, oh man, these guys can fly over that 50 foot gap on their snowboard. And that's just going to flick that light switch and be like, well, heck I can do that. So then instead of them starting down here where I did, they come in right here and then they're able to just push it even that much higher. Um, so in some cases it's, it's, it's a little bit bittersweet. Um, if I'm not the fastest guy out there, but if I'm not, I sure want somebody else that's wearing my equipment to be on the top. So, um, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the upcoming games in Beijing 2022, where the majority of my class is going to be wearing equipment that uh, I built in my shop here. So i um, really looking forward to that and as well that's as awesome. on the, the motocross and snow cross side in the past. Uh, I've always had athletes wearing my equipment uh, lined up on the start gate with me. So yeah, it's fun. It, it puts a whole new dynamic into it all. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> um, so tell us about a time risk-taking and failure led to an innovative breakthrough in your work. Can you tell us about that, Mike? Yeah, the, one, the first one that comes to mind is uh, X Games, Summer X Games 2009. I'm seven months out of my amputation. Uh, I'm on my prototype moto knee on this insane supercross track. So basically this is inside the stadium uh, in Los Angeles on this gnarly track with like 90 foot jumps on it, oh, um, whoop sections, rhythm section. And uh, I just had my leg amputated seven months before. I just nice. finished my prototype moto knee um, I've had like two months of riding on it and I, you know, I'm just pushing myself to the max and I, I came up short on a, a really big super kicker jump, basically fell out of the sky. And when I landed, it broke the carbon fiber foot. So I had the moto knee design, but I was using a, a standard everyday walking foot. And, uh, when I impacted it snapped in, well, it didn't snap completely in two, but it, it lost all of its strength. So from that point on through the rest of the race, every time I would hit hard, it would flex and, and slide off the foot peg. So yeah, that, that definitely motivated me to create the, the VersaFoot um, the following months later, which uh, is now one of our um, main products since 2010, uh, I believe is when we, we or right. 2011, when we made it available to everybody. But uh, yeah, that's what, that's, what's cool about sports and competition is like, it pushes you so far. So you're going to find the weak points and uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, you got to um, either create something new or modify it to be better. How about you, Sarah, you use any equipment that failed and you tried to make it better? <laughs> Many times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when the, when the mono skis were, were developing, in the beginning, we were seeing a lot of homemade designs of leaf springs, just a, a car leaf spring attached to a ski and it would bounce along. Um, so we would take a lot of time and go to Mount Hood in the summertime and, and test out new equipment prior to the season. And this was about in June on the glacier. And we could learn from each other. We, did, we didn't all have to have the same model, but we could see each other's rigs, how, how they react to, to bumps. And um, the tough part was working with sponsors. You might be working with a new manufacturer who thinks that they might have the new model out there. And you 
if, the, if a big event's coming up and it's not working out for you at a certain point, you have to decide whether it's going to, whether you're going to stick with this or you're going to go back to the old speed that people are going to laugh at you and, and, and say, why are you skiing on this, this old rig? Um, and that's what I had to do. It was a short time before the Paralympics. And I finally had to say, I don't feel confident. I think you did a really good job with this ski. ski. I think it's good for certain um, applications, just not for me and what I'm trying to accomplish. And I ended up having to go back to, to the old big red that's in the museum now. Um, and I remember the, the German, my friends from the German team saying, you know, I, I can't believe you're still skiing on this, but it still seems to work for you. Right. Um, and, and then the, the next year, Kevin Bramble came out with an amazing new mono ski that it was just past my time. And right. you have to accept that. In yeah. some ways, you have to accept it. And then if you have a better idea, you can maybe, like Mike says, build it for the next generation. There you go. Why don't we um, take just a little break here? Emma, you wanna pull up those um, objects out of storage since we've been talking about the big red and, and Mike's uh, Moto Universal Versa foot. Maybe we can pull those slides up and talk about those a little bit. So this is the big red that uh, Sarah was talking about. This is a what? mono ski. Uh, and this, this was manufactured in 1984 by the German company, um, GFL Technic. So um, I guess this is what the Germans is what Sarah was talking about. Do you want to talk about this, Sarah? You've had experience well, this, in these, I'm sure. <laughs> this is actually one of the original, original, this kind of predates mine. Um, mine was big red just because it was the same color and that's what right. I called it, ironically. Um, but I was talking about the leaf spring and basically that's what this is. It's a ski with a leaf spring and a ski over it. And you have outriggers. Those are just Canadian crutches with ski, skis on the end. Right. And it was a, a wonderful progression from the sit down model uh, before that. You just, it was like a sled and it was on the ground and you saw very little control. Um, so I was, I started just after this generation and they had a shock absorber that it had a good compression, but it didn't have a good rebound, which mm -hmm. Mike knows more about, which you could go into a turn and it would bounce, but it would also spit you out of the turn because it <laughs> had no dampening. So you oh, had to ski in a way that only that only was you, your equipment was limiting you. You had to go bounce, bounce, settle, turn instead of it being like a knee or a, a nice motorcycle shock where you would stick it to the ground and you would be able to do one continuous turn as it compressed and slowly decompressed. So you just you have to work with what you're given. And that is right. the, the beauty of it that, that sparks invention. Right. It, you can only go as far as you can go. And then somebody like Mike and Jim Martinson and, and the folks that take this sport to the next level. And then it becomes a case of, can the athlete handle the equipment that has now come so far? Right. Do we have, I mean, do we have that picture of Sarah um, in, in the sit ski that for, I think it was in the first slide. Um, Cause that is the technology that was that one. So that is a sit ski, which, you know, was after the big red that we have in the museum. Do you want to talk about that, Sarah? Cause that's different. That gave you right. that control. It, so this is uh, the only, what we were running to, into on big jumps as we were continually breaking skis off right at the front binding, at the front bracket. And so you see in this picture, this little yellow shock, mm -hmm. there's a small damper on the front of that ski, which is not the way a ski is design, designed to turn. It's designed to turn and bend from the, from the center. But that was what we were doing to keep the skis from breaking when we would mm -hmm. land. Um, and then the next generation came along and was using a, a, a binding where you would actually just click into the ski and you would mm. pin it so that it wouldn't come loose. But that allowed the ski to bend in the middle 
of the ski rather than what it's doing here, which we were losing some control with uh, a ski is still a ski is still a ski. Right. Start from the ski up, not the disability down. Right. Hmm. It, it was a it was a great ride. This is just like like what Mike is doing. Every Jim Martinson came up with this model. Everybody on the team was riding this model. Everybody was competing against each other on this model. So he was a winner either way. We were right. all we were all on the podium. yeah. There you go. All right. Well, let, that's a good segue. Let's go to Mike's. Um, I think we have pictures of the Moto Me and. Okay, there we go. So this is um, this is the second iteration, isn't it, Mike? I think. Yeah, this is not yeah. the one we have at the museum. We have a like a first generation. Yeah, exactly. Um, the image on the on the left of the screen, that's our our new second generation VersaFoot, which has been around for about two years. And then the brand new second generation Moto Knee. And uh, basically the the difference between um, the first generation and the second generation of the foot is we added a a carbon fiber sole plate with another dimension of movement in it where it allows the heel to compress on heel strike mm -hmm. as you're walking. Um, the, the forward lean or the dorsiflexion is, is basically the same as the old model. And then the, the knee system, we actually reduced it by nearly two inches in overall length, which allows us to um, accommodate shorter individuals and with different lengths of uh, amputations. And then uh, we put a couple more adjustments on it. And we took nearly a pound off of it as well, which is extremely important as an oh, amputee yeah. carrying a, a prosthetic limb around. Well, um, I know when so I, the, the one we have at the museum, which I think maybe the next slide, that is heavy. You know, when I have to pull that out of a, you know, this is the one on the, um, so this is the one we have at the museum and it's all connected. So, um, but it, it's, it's kind of heavy. I, I can't imagine yeah. having to, you know, having to use that. Yeah, so basically, um, so my amputation was taken three inches above my knee center, uh, which we estimated that they removed about 15 pounds of bone and tissue. Mm -hmm. And my complete prosthesis with the foot, the knee system and the socket, which uh, I don't know if you've got any slides of those, but that's basically the, the carbon fiber uh, bucket or so to speak that I slide my limb inside and that entire mm -hmm. unit weighs anywhere between 14 and 16 pounds depending on you know what it, what's it all attached to it so I guess it's not as heavy as I think it is <laughs> well it's, it's uh well your 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 human human body parts are actually I mean they're what 80 percent water so they're very right. heavy but being that they're attached at several connection points, you don't you don't really notice how how heavy you know your limbs are. Right, exactly. And I think the slide before was you in the shop. I think um, you kind of skipped over that one. There you go. And so yeah, that's drawings. Uh, that's my previous shop um, at my old place. That was in uh, 2010, I think. And uh, on the right, you see the sketches of the original modem knee design. Um, those are the sketches that I supplied to the machine shop and they wrote the CNC code for it, uh, which we've come leaps and bounds since then. Now um, we use SolidWorks CAD program. I've got an in-house CAD designer that takes all my sketches and drawings and uh, puts them into 3D models, which we can manipulate and modify so much easier than a, an eraser and pencil. So um, <laughs> over this last year, uh, being with the COVID situation and me not traveling as much with uh, the, the competition side of my program, uh, we've hammered out some really cool new designs and uh, which uh, we'll be launching here over the next couple months. Uh, so it's going to be really exciting. Progression. Yeah, always. That's the best part of it. So and what, I, what advice can you guys, this. okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to go real quick to the, the previous slide where the um, there should be a little video. Uh, if if you're able to play that, then you can see all the how it all works together. Or maybe not. Maybe that maybe it just came across as an image. We did have a video at some point. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, no, not that video. It was the one on the um, it was like a, a 
3D model or a two-dimensional model. You had the right slide. It was just maybe click on the picture. Yeah. Or you can just show you right here. Oh, there you go. Oh, I like the red. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the knee joint works like that as I shift my weight into it. And then right. the ankle compresses on this axis as I put weight into the toe or forward. So it's too stiff to compress here, but. So this is oh, actually wow. a mountain bike shock that I can uh, add or release air pressure to make it stiffer or softer. Very cool. Nice. Do we want to share that video on Mike? now i mean i think we were supposed to do it earlier and, and we did not but we can show that now if you want i like videos me too <laughs> and when you put on red white and blue jersey for team usa it's, it's more than just a jersey. It's, it, it means that you're part of something bigger. You're representing your country. And, and I have the possibility of making our national anthem play on top of the podium at the 2018 Winter Paralympics in South Korea. I had a, a wreck during a competition and I knew it was bad. It was a compound fracture in my left leg. After a few surgeries, we, doctors basically told me, um, we, we've got a tough decision here. We think it's best to amputate your leg just above the knee in order to, uh, to save your life. You know, we, we kind of thought, thought to ourselves, I'm like, now what? I mean, I'm a professional athlete and I just had my leg amputated. I've always been a problem solver, working in the shop, trying to figure out how things work and what better thing to focus on than my leg. I started drawing, uh, drawing a design and then I uh, figured I had what I needed, and went out to the shop and started cutting parts. And about a week later, I had the first prototype, Moto Knee. And I tell you what, I was like, I was like a little kid. I was, I was so excited. At that point, I knew that, you know, this is really gonna work. I'm gonna be able to, to get out and ride like, like I normally did. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. Very cool. So what advice would you <laughs> what advice would you guys give um, offer to someone interested in inventing? I don't know who wants to go first. How you about know, Sarah? I, I would I would say um, have some fun with it. Get creative and there's a little tribe of of builders and creators and um you know i see mike and i see kevin bramble who can weld and do all these things and they you can i would really encourage people to take metal shop to take wood shop my mother took wood shop in 1945 and it was not a popular place for females at that time and um when she did that, she encouraged me to kind of go against the grain and say, if you if there's something that you want to get involved that that's not popular because of because you're a girl or or whatever that limitation is, to find out how you can do it, and um, it, it really made a difference because it made me comfortable with being in a place that wasn't always um, w welcome there with welcome meaning with a open arms but just to to learn from each other learn from um like you say and, and write everything down and 
you've heard it a million times, but keep that little notebook right by your bed. Because sometimes you come up with these ideas that you think are great and you think you're going to remember, remember them, but you, you don't and they go away. But if you write them down, either someday you will look at them and laugh out loud or, or it, it could make a big difference in your life. You never know. Yeah, I, I would say the advice I would say for somebody who's uh, you know, looking to, to create something is, uh, well, first off, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, like literally just dig in there. And, you know, if it's um, a mechanical component, component of some sort, like just familiar, familiarize yourself with mechanical components. So you start thinking in the right way. Um, and like, if there truly is a motivation to solve a problem, you know, it's different for everybody, but, uh, you know, figure out really what, what you're trying to sort out and what the end goal is. And once you know that, you know, it can be different and it, it may not be obvious right away what the actual goal of your solution is. Um, and, but once you do figure that out, then start backtracking and figure out the steps needed to accomplish it. Cause, uh, for example, a lot of, uh, solutions are, are, are really complex. The end product is, is very simple, but uh, solving it is, is complex. And sometimes you need to learn a whole new craft. For example, I had a ton of experience in the metal shop, welding, cutting, grinding, uh, and that kind of thing. But I had no experience running a mill and a lathe, machining equipment, like CNC or, or even manual equipment. Uh, so when I first started the Modoni project, I, I couldn't just cut it with a grinder and weld it together because I, I was working with really high precision components and bearings and bushings and all that. Um, so I had to kind of take a step back and learn a whole new um, set of, um, um, uh, learn how to actually use new equipment and mathematical solutions to try and sort out, you know, tolerances and all that. So, um, yeah, you, you got to step backwards, figure out uh, each step of the process, and then create a plan and follow it. Okay, so both Sarah and Mike in a previous conversation mentioned that the camaraderie found in the adaptive sports community was really special. So do you guys think that this promotes or inhibits inventiveness? I, I would say it. it it promotes inventiveness so much. At every adaptive event I've ever been to, there's also been somebody on the sidelines that has been there selling their equipment, fixing their fixing equipment, or being there for the athletes. Uh, if something wasn't working for them, uh, they could give them a replacement outrigger. Mm. Um, and also because they're doing that, they're learning how the athletes are using their equipment, um, what kind of strengths and, and what pieces are breaking regularly at each race. And then over time, you saw the, the plastic that they were using, um, the, the chemical composition was changing because it, it had to deal with, it had to withstand hitting gates every time, but also deal with cold. So you're dealing with temperature and materials. So to have those people on the sidelines using the athletes and using the sports as their testing ground was a great thing to, to see as an athlete. You knew you felt like you had support. As a builder, they had support from the athletes that were giving them very valuable feedback. Sometimes not the feedback that you always want, but feedback to improve your product and um and change the sport for the better. How about you, Mike? Does it promote inventiveness? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, uh, if you have your mind open, I mean, there's always competitors there that put a wall up around themselves and they usually don't stick around too long. Uh, but yeah, I remember the first adaptive event I went to, it just opened my eyes so big. It was the Extremity Games in 2009. And I had never been around other amputees, you know, other than just passing by. And if you want to learn how to solve some problems and think outside the box, go to an adaptive motocross race where you've got 
paraplegics, you've got low limb, lower limb amputees, upper limb amputees, and they're all figuring out a solution to try and get them back into their sport so they can enjoy it. And um, so, yeah, absolutely. And the cool thing about it is, it is in the adaptive sports world, we've all had our butts kick one way or another. And the real true motivation or the reason why we're there is because we love sport so much that we are willing to go through all this crap to, to continue on and forward to get that smile on your face and enjoy life. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, for the most part, it's a very fun group to be part of, which is far different than professional sports. You know, I came from mm-hmm. uh, professional snow cross racing and uh, our teams, you know, we were working together as a team inside our circle, but everybody else outside of that, it's like, no, don't, don't come in, don't come in here without knocking. I, you know, we're not going to share anything with you. Um, we're going to try and get every edge we possibly can, which adaptive sports are obviously very competitive, but for the most part, we're all looking at the bigger picture. And if somebody has got something that might work or help out in a different application, yeah, it's, uh, we're always talking about it. Yeah. If I, I've talked to adaptive athletes and it's always about participation, you know, it's, it's letting, letting the athlete participate. I mean, whether they win, lose, whatever competing or just recreational, at least they're still participating in sport. And that's very important. But I mean, the gold is very, very, very important. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 This is true. Especially when you're a Paralympian and an ex gamer, but I mean, it's also important for that kid who, you know, just wants to ski and, you know, or just wants to snowboard and can use one of your legs and one of your prosthetics to, you know, to get in the game and, and do it just as a recreational activity, which is good too. You know, how do you guys think, um, especially with kids, how do you think they can become more inventive? Do you have any ideas along those lines? Uh, well, we, we touched on it earlier. What I'm thinking, uh, let, let your kids fail. Like let them mm-hmm. solve their own problems in some cases, obviously, if there's a safety <laughs> issue, um, help them out. But yeah, just kind of stand back and let them figure it out on their own. Right now, the way society is, is everything's at our fingertips and nobody's mm-hmm. really got to think very much compared to what they used to uh, with all the knowledge at their fingertips. But uh, yeah, it, the more challenges you have as you're growing up, the better your process of thinking will become. I, I agree, Mike. I, I see a lot of protection, people being so protected from our elements, uh, not to get dirty, not to fall. And um, the way I look at it is, Sometimes people are looking at us with our disabilities as fragile. And I have to say, disabled athletes are the toughest people I have mm-hmm. ever met in my entire life yeah, because they don't that. have to just deal with uh, their sport. They have to deal with the reality of, yes, we do have a disability and we do have to get our equipment from point A to point B and live with the with the. Um, with the situations that have come along with having a disability. But to, um, as I say, they make really cool band-aids these days. And, you know, it's okay to let your kids bleed a little. Mm -hmm. Because that way you actually experience what it feels to to have an injury. Um, And those injuries, will promote you to invent something to prevent those injuries, uh, which is very important. Um, My father used to say to me, why don't you have a roll bar on that mono ski? (sighs) And the reality was physics can tell you with the roll bar, if it flipped, it's gonna flip me higher. (laughs) It might've saved my neck, but it's gonna flip me higher. So um, it's okay to just, take a little time for yourself and, and figure them out because sometimes, sometimes doing things together is really fun. Um, and other people can see things a different way than you've been staring at it the same way for endlessly. That's, that's helpful. It's also helpful to give yourself some time alone so that you don't feel pressured to 
find an end solution to something that may or may not happen. Um, and, um, you know, just to, sometimes when you're in the starting gate and you know things are not right, you have to roll with it. You have to go with it. And um, knowing your limits, knowing what your equipment can handle is, is all part of it. And, uh, you know, go ahead, kids, get your hands dirty. Just, just go, that the greatest thing was to just go and, and get greasy. There's a certain smell to it. There's a certain smell of a shop, a certain mm -hmm. smell to cutting wood. It's very yeah. organic. Mm -hmm. And um, it also makes you feel really good that you tried it for yourself, which is right. uh, like Mike says, everything's at our fingertips these days and everything's replaceable. Um, try not to replace it, try to fix it. So is yeah, inventing yeah, for kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kids, go take your parents' lawnmower apart and see how it works. <laughs> Monster Mike told you so. It'll help you make, it'll help make you smarter. One of my kids did that with his bike and then he couldn't get it back together. And he's like, mom, put it back together. I'm like, I don't know how to put this bike back together. But too, we figured it out. We did. We figured it out eventually. It took a couple weeks, but we did it. <laughs> so is inventing for para-athletes, um, I, I mean, is that different? Is that more challenging like than inventing just something else? I, I don't think so, but I think that more people are, are more interested in what you're doing because sometimes people think that we don't get to participate in their world of, uh, you know, being non being disabled. And mm -hmm. in reality is sometimes people without a disability don't get to participate in what we're doing because of fear of maybe we shouldn't stare or maybe not get involved. And um, what it makes it really fun is, is they get to be invited into our world and to, to see what we do as athletes with disabilities. And that we're, we're all the same, but um, it's such an encouraging group that it, it's, the most motivated group of people that I've ever known. And um, we, we, we thrive off of each other. And we actually look at each other's welds these days on, our, on all of our equipment. Oh, nice weld. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even when I was in competition, I would look at all the other mono skis in the field. And if it was an X games, you could tell right away that weld, weld would not hold. That, you could take five mono skis right off the starting block and say that he's not going to make it past the first jump. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, you know, knowing equipment, knowing how things are built, knowing how they move on a certain jump and, and knowing the rider's ability on those pieces of equipment gives you a huge advantage in competition. Just by taking the numbers out on what the inventors are putting out there on the slopes or out there on the, in the fields. So, so it's not just about your equipment. There's a mental game that goes along with knowing your equipment and knowing what everybody else has. So mm -hmm. it makes it really fun to play little mind games. <laughs> Is that what you think, Mike? <laughs> uh yeah, there's there's some similarity thought process there. Um, so when I when I'm thinking about creating adaptive equipment, there's a couple different levels of thought process that go into it, comparing it to something else. Um, because you're you're incorporating typically you're incorporating a human action into it. So like you've got to understand what your end goal is and understand what the person is physically capable of and then what kind of a tool you're going to have to create to bridge that gap. And, you know, depending on, you know, amputee or paraplegic or, um, you know, whatever the case may be, in some cases, the user may not even realize what they can do physically. So basically what I'm trying to say is like, they may have to learn how to physically function in order to control this new tool. Like, uh, you know, for my prosthetic leg, I spend a ton of time in the gym here 
in trying to um, match what my prosthesis is capable of. And, you know, a lot of cases, a lot of times that has to do with balance and um, improving my muscle strength in a certain area to help provide stability. Um, the, another unique part about it is the motivation behind it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, typically for myself, I mean, I was extremely motivated to get myself back in action. And if you're someone, an inventor who's working on somebody else's pro, uh, adaptive uh, piece of equipment, um, you'll, you'll soon realize that there's a ton of motivation. And then the reward is extremely big, being able to create a tool that helps somebody achieve something that they never thought possible. I mean, that, that is huge. And that's one of the things that really motivates me to continue working away in the shop. And whether I'm helping my competitors on the racetrack be faster than I am, I mean, I still got a huge smile when I, I see some of these athletes do something that's just mind boggling. It, it's so rewarding. And if you have a chance to help somebody out uh, create an adaptive device, I definitely recommend uh, giving it a try. So what is your proudest um... What, what are you proudest of in your inventive career? I mean, Mike, it sounds like all of that <laughs> you're proud of. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the first moto knee I built. Um, definitely is it uh, so many people, like they knew I was a very capable fabricator and I could create some really cool things. But then when I mentioned after my injury that I was going to create a prosthetic knee system to get me back into racing motocross at a, a high level. They're like, ah, I don't know about that. And then when I was finally able to learn everything I needed to learn in order to design and fabricate this moto knee prototype, um, nothing's going to stand beside that. I mean, well, maybe in the future, but I mean, that's definitely my proudest, proudest component I've built to date. How about you, Sarah? I, I would say my proudest build would be when I was mountain bike racing and we were an adaptive class racing in an able-bodied world in the National mm -hmm. Off-Road Bicycle Association races in the, sometimes we would be in the sport category, sometimes in the pro category, wherever the trail would allow us to get through the width of the trees was generally how it would work. But what we were seeing as the sport was, was progressing, now the shocks on these off-road bicycles were about four independent shocks and the price was being driven up. Now you're talking $6,000 to have a, a nice ride down the hill, more like a Cadillac ride. But to try to find a happy medium of building an off-road bike that had um, basic shocks that would still give you some comfort without without the price tag of a four to six thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar off-road um, mountain bike that doesn't even have a motor. So oh, I wow. worked with a, uh, and we were talking about collaboration. I ended up working with a NASCAR builder. And oh, cool. And at first the shocks that he wanted to use were, were too big, too beefy. And to really, to, to come between a car and a go-kart, a car and a bicycle and work together to come out with something that would be $1,500. So more people would be able to, to obtain that bicycle to, to get more people out in the woods. Because that was ultimately my goal was I knew what it was like to ski race and go flying by the trees and in the woods, but I wanted to wear a t-shirt and just go out in the woods in the summertime and, and experience summer. And that's the way I was able to do it. And um, we built a bike, it worked and it, it, it was great for its use and time. And now the, the, the off-road bikes are they're amazing that they're, you're going to want to spend more money, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we made it for the common man. And that was our accomplished, our goal. Awesome. awesome. So 
do you guys have any, you know, what would you invent for the future? Do you have any projects that anybody wants to talk about or before we get into questions from the, I think there's a bunch of questions for you guys. So let's talk about future inventions. That's, that's, per, that's proprietary. I can't share any details at this point in time. <laughs> no problem. No problem. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, the ultimate, the ultimate goal for me in my shop would be to, uh, to build a leg that like I can communicate through my, my mind, which is, uh, you know, using nerve and, oh. um, integration. And, you know, they're, they're working on that, but, you know, the science right. that is backing or is uh, trial and error with that right now is, uh, incredible. It's not too far out, but, uh, yeah, my goal would be to make it. So it, it's not so expensive. It's not, uh, oh. implanted in, so I'm not afraid to, throw it on and, and go huck myself down a mountain and fly over a big gap and land in the dirt or snow or water, whatever it is, and not have to worry about, you know, missing out on $200,000, uh, which is uh, probably the case that this new version stuff that'll be coming out. But yeah, create something that I can control with, with my, my own nerves and muscles. Right. That'd be awesome. How about you, Sarah? Would you like to see anything invented out there? Um, you know, I am working on um, just my everyday life, the things to make my life easier, uh, uh, working on my truck. I have a, a Ford F-150, and it was working amazing for me 10 years ago when I was stronger to get in and out of it. And right. now uh, I need a different process and I need to put a motor in there of some kind to, to get my chair in and out. So something that I, I've had the opportunity to do is work with automotive companies in, in making adaptive uh, cars and trucks. But oftentimes uh, they want to over-engineer things. And so I'm trying to, to simplify the process to, make, to, to, to keep things um, that work according to weather. For instance, a, mm. uh, a ramp, uh, a mechanical ramp might work great in a van in Florida, but it might not work as well in the snow and ice of Colorado. So I have to figure out these problems just for everyday life to make... Um, to make my life more uh, meaningful and to enjoy life without thinking about the things that limit us in right. any kind of way. So um, organization, it's just changing your processes. You don't have to be a huge inventor sometimes, you just have to change your processes for your changing condition. And that's not always easy when you're used to being um, on top of the podium. And it's not my goal to be on top of the podium anymore. It's my goal to get to the grocery store and have enough energy for whatever it else is I want to do in my day. You so. were on the top of the podium quite often. So, you know, I think you fulfilled that goal. <laughs> I think I like this position just fine. Yeah, I bet. It's nice to just kind of step back and watch everybody else. Yes. So um, we have some questions in the chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and, um, and read a couple to you guys. So this one's from Kip Carrier. And um, they ask, can you recount how you overcame the shock of your accident and set upon a new life? My son is in the ICU after falling six stories and will never be the same person physically. So I don't know who wants to take that one first. I'll, I'll take that one. Um is is for me I, I think in the beginning I was a, a big time athlete I was a lacrosse player and uh, did karate I did I, I did so many different physical sports and when the accident happened and things changed um, my advice would be to embrace this new world it is amazing uh, the people that I've met through it are the strongest, the most inspirational, the most compassionate people I've ever met. And not only the people going through the situation themselves, but their families and what they are going through to 
um, find out about different adaptive programs and uh, go into it slowly. Uh, not, not, you can go into it full, quickly or slowly, but, but be conscious of your emotions. It is a transition, but to go in there with open arms and an open heart because uh, it, it, it's such a, a, a giving community and um, it's hard to let go of some of our older ties and hang on to the past, but embracing the future Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful new world and I wouldn't change a thing. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, really sorry to hear about that accident. It's, uh, it's a tough one. And like for me, when my injury happened, I, I had to hit the reset button and really evaluate the priorities in life and what I, I really thought was important. And, um, so many times when people get injured or they're faced with a, a life-changing moment, um, right away they're, they're so hung up on the things that they can't do. For example, the sports or activities, the physical functions that they're unable to do, they just get discouraged right away. But uh, you, know, you, you, gotta, you gotta walk before you run kind of mentality. It's like, yeah, you, you definitely want to find those goals that are out here and the things that you want to be able to do, but you got to reel it back and just take it one day at a time, one step at a time, physically recover. Then you start your mental recovery and then you start figuring out what you're capable of, what you want to try and accomplish, and then just try and sort out a, an action plan to, um, to achieve what you want to achieve, whether it's, uh, you know, your simple everyday functions that you want to try and figure out, like do the research on adaptive equipment that's available, um, reach out to these uh, different um, um, adaptive athlete communities. Cause I mean, there's so many people that have went through the same thing. I guarantee you, there are people that are, have, have uh, went through very similar challenges and you know, most of them are able to get over it. It takes more time for some than others. But the mm -hmm. most important thing is, is just to really take a moment to figure out what's, it, what's really important to you and then build your program around that. And don't be afraid to ask for help because it's, uh, it can be so challenging on many different levels, mentally and physically. And um, just reach out to your, your family, your loved ones, your friends. And um you know, that's the biggest thing is having that support system around you and, and using it, lean on them. Um, I, I personally have a, a, a amazing family. My wife, Sarah, she's been by my side through this, through thick and thin. And uh, honestly, it's not going to always be easy, but uh, if you stick together, you'll be able to uh, be able to, to, to get through it. Good advice from both of you. Um, okay, the next person, um, it's she or they asked, could you both speak to the tension between the value of failure in the inventive process and the fear of failure in competitive sports culture? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, okay. Yeah, you can't be afraid to fail. You don't look at it as a failure. I don't care what it is. It's not a failure if you can learn something from it. Uh, losing stinks. If you make a mistake, that that's hard. Uh, but if you only make that mistake one time, then it was worth it. So you just got to look at it like that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Do you want to respond, great. Sarah? You want me to go to the next question? <laughs> you can go to the next one. I don't want to re. re redo a perfect quest answer. Okay. Um, so Jamie Schultz writes, this is so fascinating. Thank you. Have you encountered instances where paratechnology has been ruled performance enhancing and therefore illegal versus performance improving? Yes. Um, for a while there in alpine skiing, they were, we have downhill suits and there's a little hole in the suit with a little um, metal piece that it, it has a machine that the air goes through it. So a certain amount of air is supposed to go through your suit. 
for safety reasons. So you don't end up with a plastic suit and fall and then just keep on going mm -hmm. um, for, for many different reasons. But uh, at one point we wanted to be used as adaptive skiers putting on protective gear and the protective gear was changing the aerodynamics of the suit. And some suit designers were trying mm -hmm. to put a little piece of metal um, down the spine of it, or just so that the air would go over it a little bit better through for aerodynamics. So as suits were, were, as rules were changing, our sport was changing as well. Things were getting faster to the point where we can't just be riding mono skis at 60, 70 miles an hour with no protection. So again, you have to kind of, um, challenge you're challenging the rules and regulations but you also have to work with let's work with the safety regulations so you kind of um, partner with people to kind of change rules and regulations as your sport or as your inventions change um, and you don't necessarily know that somebody's going to say yes this invention is going to is going to pass we can we can work with it or not. So you really do have to work with um, people in the sport who are writing the rules, right? Challenging them, but working with them as well. You want to comment, Mike? Sure. Um, yeah, I have in the the competitions I do. I have not been questioned at all about uh, overperforming. Um, against like able body athletes. I guess there has been a couple eyebrows raised with my motocross bike, which I've uh, retrofitted with an automatic shifter or not an automatic, uh, a power shifter, um, which can in some cases actually allow me to shift quicker. So on the whole shot, um, mm. in some cases, if it works out just perfect, you know, I might be just a, a millisecond quicker on a shift than a competitor. Um, but you know, as far as the prosthetics, not yet. Um, I know there has been lots of discussion about it in track and field with bilateral uh, lower limb amputees or uh, below knee amputees, uh, simply because of the design of the carbon fiber running blades that they're we're making and the length of them. In some cases, that was allowing athletes to gain a longer stride compared to what their normal body height would be. Um, but on the flip side of that, take it, for example, if you're starting in a starting block as a bilateral baloney amputee, you're never going to uh, launch out of the blocks as quick. So you're giving up some over here because you just don't have the function, the motor function that an able body athlete does. So, I mean, that is probably the, the closest area where there's lots of questions and regulations being uh, looked at and modified. Uh, so they don't overperform what a uh, uh, able-bodied athlete could. So when your Moto Knee and VersaFoot first came out, they didn't, they, there weren't any questions. I mean, did you have to show that to somebody? I mean, like. Uh, in, the, in the motocross side, no, that, that's, such, that's so new. So um, there was no like uh, physical uh, mechanics of it that allows me to perform any better because uh, basically okay. I'm stuck to the foot peg, which I'm giving up a ton okay. in all of the left-hand corners. Uh, in the Paralympic snowboarding, basically I have to provide images and explanation of what my, mm. my prosthetic equipment uh, is capable of and what it looks like and just make sure there's no powered components to it. Like there's no motors or batteries or that kind of thing. Gotcha, okay. Okay, the next question is from Meg Maher. She wants to know what keeps your creative and inventive juices flowing? I don't know who wants to take that one. <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, sometimes when, when you've been attached to one identity of skiing, um, it's hard to let that go a little bit and try something new, try something that you're not as comfortable with. And um, for now, my inventiveness is, is 
in my art, in my painting. And even though I went to, to a school that had an art program, uh, I still learn so much from the internet. I learn so much from other artists. And uh, for a while there, I was having difficulty with oil paints and I really wanted to work with oil paints, but I was getting, um, I, I, I physically, they were making me, me ill. So uh, I learned through other people that you could use Vaseline and house paint and it doesn't sound fancy, but if a famous painting was passed off to a museum as a fake using this technique of Vaseline and house paint, it's good enough for me. And to, to not be afraid to, uh, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be fancy to change right. something that works for you. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive to, to invent something that works for you. Um, to use the things around your house uh, as a start to a better process to whatever it is you're doing. And then you might look at that, that first prototype for a long time and come up with something different. But just remember, it doesn't have to happen all at once. They, it, it rarely does. It sometimes takes a little time to step back from something not think about it at all, clear your head, forget about what it is you were working on. Like Mike says, that's why you have to write it down, whether it was a good thing or not. And then sometimes when you forget that, you come back with a completely fresh outlook on it or somebody else goes by it and takes another look at it and has a completely different look, a different idea. So I'm just trying to be, um, to open to new ideas knowing that they're not always going to work out. Um, and don't, don't overspend trying to come up with a solution when you, when you don't have all the ideas just yet. Experiment. Nice. You wanna take that mic or should we go to the next question? Um, yeah, I guess, well, I just answer real quick. Um, yeah, what keeps me, my juices flowing as far as, uh, solving problems is, is being motivated uh, to solve a problem and then just use all my past experience to, uh, to try and formulate a solution. And uh, getting to work with my, my in-house CAD designer, which I've, I've always worked on my own up until just a couple of years ago. And uh, having another really smart individual to bounce ideas off is, uh, is a really good thing when you're trying to solve a problem or getting a fresh new look at something. Nice, nice, okay. Um, the next one, this is for both of you. Um, did your experience recovering from and adapting to your respective injuries change your sense of daring and or competitiveness? Were you timid at first in returning to sport or were you actually even more daring? Does being inventive make you a better athlete? I, I think that I've seen it from both sides. Uh, I. I think my family was, was surprised that I was the one that had the ski accident because I was more, I was safer. I, I would say overall than my, my brother, but um, I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic. I lost track with you there. That's okay. Um, recovering from and adapting oh. to respective injuries. Your, your, did your sense of daring and competitiveness change? I think it, at first it did because I had never in my life encountered um, panic. I didn't know what panic mm -hmm. was. I'd seen other people panic and, and be afraid of this, most of the situations that I was in. Um, and I think the first time I felt panic, the first time I felt fear, uh, I didn't know what to do with that emotion. And then mm -hmm. I apologized to all my friends for not understanding how they felt um, scared of, of whatever it was, whether the ice skating too close to the edge of the melting pond. I never had that sense of fear. And now um, 
there's there's something else. I, I have to realize that I am in a wheelchair. I do have a disability and my shoulders are very important just to get around in my everyday life. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I would see other people on the team push their ability farther than what they could handle and hurt themselves, uh, it didn't, I would very much try to avoid that to, to go back a couple of steps, feel comfortable with your mistakes, then go forward, then come back. And it wasn't, I wasn't going to, to push that ragged edge. I wanted to stay on the inside of the ragged edge, but know where that ragged edge was. And like Mike was saying, to be strong enough to know that you can handle it because you shouldn't be challenging it if your body can't handle that kind of um, power. And that's going to take time. It's going to take time for you to figure out what your body can handle. And um, for me, when I knew what my goal was, I knew I wanted to be on the U.S. adaptive ski team. Then I started my bicycle. I, I didn't have a hand bike. So I just rode ride in my wheelchair where I didn't have weights. I would pick up a milk jug. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be fancy. It just, you just have to know where you are in your particular quest right how about you mike were you timid at first returning to the sport or did it make you more daring oh man it it totally changed changed up my thought process a lot um for a while i i wasn't interested in competing again for a while i mean that was a solid month and a half maybe maybe two months and then, and, then I started feeling, <laughs> and then I started feeling better and more capable. And then it was just about that feeling of the challenge. It, it, for me, it's all about the challenge. That's what motivates me, honestly, is trying to figure something out. Uh, but after my accident, that started the whole change in thought process where I, I use these risk versus reward assessment charts. And um And I just remember so many conversations with my wife, Sarah, and when we were discussing getting back into competition, it's like, is this really worth it? Are you willing to risk getting hurt again? Maybe this time even worse because of the added complications with not having control over my leg. And so we definitely had to pump the brakes a little bit and Mm -hmm. really make calculated decisions on what the goal was and what the process to get there was going to be. And I couldn't just wing it like I I used to, you know, so many times you just have the mentality, just going to send it. Like, I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. And after I became an amputee and, and, you know, it, it, racing snow cross bit me, it bit me hard and it, it changed my whole life. And so every time I'm taking on a new challenge or a competition, um, we go through these risk assessments and uh, decide how hard I'm going to push it, you know, to achieve the goal. And the goal may not always be to win. It may be to get on the podium or it may be to make the final or it may be just to elevate my performance to a certain level um, and just slowly step by step. So, you know, overall, it's just forced me to make more calculated decisions and Mm -hmm. uh, more calculated process to achieve my goals. Nice. So this next question is kind of along those lines. It's from Sam Brady. And he asks, do you feel it is significant as disabled people slash people with disabilities to be the people inventing and iterating equipment for other disabled people and people with disabilities to use? Well, Go ahead, Mike. Oh, yeah, I'll just say, um, well, nobody's going to be more motivated to solve the problem than the actual person with, uh, with the disability. Um, granted, they may not always be the engineer that are capable of solving it. But if, for example, you are an engineer and you're an amputee or a paraplegic, um, you're probably the best person to solve that problem if you got the tools right. to figure it out. I, I agree. Um, if I have to say, I'd be more willing to trust somebody, an inventor who was riding a mono ski versus somebody who wasn't. Wasn't. 
Yeah. And Sam Brady also writes, would you say that there is still room for major innovations in adaptive sports technology or has it stabilized and it's now about chasing marginal gains? Ooh, um, I, I mentioned earlier that there's always going to be room for improvement. Um, sometimes those improvement might be so far advanced that uh, the athlete can't handle the equipment going that fast anymore. Mm. So they have to match. And, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend a, a heavy model that we would use in the X games for, for a beginner. You would just have to, to kind of choose the model that's going to work best for your ability. Um, and work with it, but. Uh, Mike seems to be inventing a lot of stuff. <laughs> so he's not finished, uh, you know, contributing to the adaptive sports technology, I guess. I think yeah, it's gonna, gonna continue forever. Um, yeah. And it, it has to, because everybody with a new disability is adapting to new equipment. Every all So it's always going to be changing and um, uh, you know, hats off to Mike. If he makes a better product, then somebody's gonna try to challenge him in that arena. Yeah. That's not on the it's not on the 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 slopes or on the games fields anymore. It's it's within the technology. Yeah, absolutely. Room for improvement. And what's so cool right now these days is um well with with social media, the way it's able to connect people. Like 10 years ago, uh, an adaptive athlete or an amputee didn't even realize or, or wouldn't have ever believed what we're doing today, for example, in Paralympic mm -hmm. snowboarding. Um, and the tools have allowed us to progress to a certain point. And, and the more people that understand that, it just keeps raising the bar. So yeah, absolutely, the, the, um, the outlook on what's possible is ever changing, which is pushing us as athletes as well as engineers. Um, and then the other really unique uh, time right now is the manufacturing processes are ever changing and there's so much new technology, whether it be software or hardware or um, machines, 3D printing processes. I mean, there's so many different ways to create materials and components that that's even allowing a whole new thought process of what's capable as far as building stuff. So it's a, it's a really fun age that we're in right now as far as manufacturing and development. Um, the, the software we're using to do some of the testing and modeling on our equipment is allowing us to like just charge that much further forward um, virtually before we even start cutting parts which fast tracks the ability or the uh, end product to be way cheaper and way faster. So it's just like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine 10 years from now, it's, it's gonna be crazy. Right, that's awesome, that's awesome. Okay, um, there's a, one more question um, from Wolfie Rudolph. If you have any intellectual property, um, patents, trademarks, et cetera. Could you tell us a bit about your experience in that realm, working with patent office attorneys, that kind of thing? Um, I haven't had that much experience. I just know from being out there on the, the field and, when, and traveling the world that every everybody from, uh, people from around the world would have their own models, their own inventions. And um, one of our inventors on our team would always say, do you have a patent on that? Mm -hmm. And it was just his way of, of kind of being out front that he's looking to make his product better based on everybody else's out there. And it, it's, it's, it's free reign out there. Um, <laughs> it really is. And sometimes that's tough because you don't want somebody to take your ideas, but um you do have to be protective because we are in competition with each other. We also are very, it's such a small world. We're going to see each other all the time. And um, we have to be cordial and we're, 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 
working with each other, but you have to be protective of your own designs. And um, the latest and the greatest, the next best thing. So good luck. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting topic and a great question because we're, we're going through patent stuff right now. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the biggest question for putting a patent on something is, why do you want to patent it? Is it for financial gains of sales or is it uh, for pride? You don't want somebody else to take it? Because uh, to be you know, straight up honest, it's expensive, ex extremely expensive to get a patent. I mean, it'll range anywhere from you know, $15,000 on up. Wow. You want it covered in the United States? Do you want it covered abroad in other countries? You got to file separate patents for each country you want it covered oh, in. Wow. And then how are you going to, uh, to fight it? If somebody, you know, goes to court with you, do you have the, the, uh, <laughs> the financial backing to actually follow through with a big court case trying to, um, um, you know, fight somebody against, you know, trying to take your patent. So it's, uh, yeah, you got to weigh a few different things. Um, we have BioAdapt here. We've got uh, a patent on the Moto Knee, and we've got another uh, couple components pending. And it's difficult because it's you know depending if if it's a niche market, you know it there may be you know it may be way too expensive. You'll never gain mm -hmm. that that profit back or that expense back. So yeah, you kind of got to weigh it. And then uh, right now the patent lasts for twenty years. So yeah, it. Uh, depending on what your plan is with it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you plan on selling the same thing for, you know, 10 years or 20 years, whatever the case, yeah, it might be worth it, but are you going to change the design and a year or two down the road and then your patents not going to be any good anymore. So mm -hmm. yeah, lots of questions uh, yeah. to try and understand if it's worth the financial and uh, the time spent on getting it. Okay. Um, I think that's all we have time for, Emma. I don't know if we have more questions or what we want to do here. It's 5.30. It's 5.32, actually. <laughs> so I guess I just want to thank, um, you know, Mike and Sarah for being here and answering all of our questions. You guys were so great. And we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so hey, much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone. Okay.